morning again and welcome to the session of Faith to Face. So glad again that you're here and thank you to those who have posted likes and comments on our YouTube and Facebook pages. We certainly hope that you'll stay connected for future sessions, either in person at Meriden Church, 5th Street Meriden, 9am on Sundays, or online on our YouTube channel or Facebook page. Just look up for Meriden Church. So in the last three sessions, we've been looking at how the Holy Spirit can make a difference in our life. And today we address the last part of this short series, looking at how can I make the most of the rest of my life? You know, we only get one life, although we might wish for more. D.H. Lawrence once said, if only we had two lives, the first one in which we make all of our mistakes and the second one in which we profit by them. But there are no dress rehearsals for life. You're on stage straight away, and we all make mistakes. But the question is, how can we live beyond them and so make the best of the rest of our life? The good news is that God loves you, and God has a great purpose for the rest of your life. Paul describes how we can make the most of the rest of our life in Romans chapter 12 and verses 1 to 2. Romans chapter 1 to 11 is all about what God has done for us. And then Romans chapter 1, 12 and verse 1, he says this, Therefore, we urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, in view of all that God has done for you, present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. So what should we do? Well, the first thing is that we need to break with the past. We are called to be different. Paul says, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. Or as J.B. Phillips translates it, don't let the world around you squeeze you into its mold. There is a world which is hostile to God and there is huge pressure to conform. It's hard to be different. <laughs> I once heard of a young police officer who was doing his final exams at police college. And the first three questions of the paper were relatively easy. And then he got to question four. And question four went like this. You're on patrol in town when an explosion occurs in a nearby street. On investigation, you find that a large hole has been blown in the footpath and there's an overturned van lying nearby. Inside the van, there's a strong smell of alcohol. Both occupants, a man and a woman, are injured. And you recognize the woman as the wife of the local police sergeant who is at present away. A passing motorist then stops to offer you assistance. And you, as you look at him, you realize he's the man who's wanted for armed robbery. Suddenly another man runs out of a nearby house shouting that his wife is expecting a baby and the shock of the explosion has made the birth imminent. And another man is crying for help, having been blown into a tree and is stuck up in the branches. So, bearing in mind the provisions of the Mental Health Act, describe in a few words what actions you would take. The police officer thought for a moment and then picking up his pen, he wrote, I would take off my uniform and mingle with the crowd. That's always the temptation, isn't it? To take off our Christian uniform and to simply go with the crowd. But we are called to remain distinctive. If you like, we're called to be a chrysalis rather than a chameleon. A chrysalis is a pupa which turns into a beautiful butterfly. A chameleon is a lizard that changes color according to the background that it's on. So if it's on a yellow background, it's yellow. On a brown background, it's brown. On a green background, it's green. And that's the temptation, isn't it? It's easy to be a Christian in a Christian environment. We easily become like everyone around us. And that creates a tension in our lives because we're one thing in one environment and another thing in another environment. We are called to be different, but we're not called to be odd. In fact, we are called to be normal. Remember, Jesus is the most normal person who ever lived. And so Paul says, break with the past and then make a new start. Be transformed. Let God transform you inwardly by a complete change, as one translation puts it. I don't know about you, but sometimes I have a fear of change. But God's not going to ask you to leave behind stuff that's good. God loves you. He wants the very best for your lives. 
And he only asks you to leave behind the rubbish in your life. And unless we leave behind that rubbish, we can't enjoy all of the treasures that God has for us. And in Romans chapter 12, Paul sets out some of these treasures that God has. In verse 9, he says, have sincere love. What is sincere love? Well, the word he actually uses here is anapokritos, which means unhypocritical. And apokritos was the mask that they put on in a Greek play. In life, we put on masks. If we're not comfortable with who we are, we say, look, I prefer to see you like this. But the trouble is, nobody ever sees you. They see the mask and you get two masks meeting. It's all about image, spin or whatever you want to call it. But when God loves you and God loves you very much, just as you are, you can drop that mask and you can be yourself. You can be authentic. You can be real. And that's what it means to be a human being loved by God. That's what God wants for our lives. And when that happens, you get a real connection happening. You know, when you first join a group or even say in your congregation, people are hesitant to be open with each other. Gradually, however, people begin to drop the masks. People start to be honest, to be vulnerable. For some reason, we think that we'll impress people by declaring our strengths. But actually, we connect best with people through our vulnerabilities. And when people drop the masks, amazing relationships begin to form. And then in Romans chapter 12 and verse 11, Paul says that our new life has an enthusiasm for our relationship with God. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. In other words, don't just have a once-off experience with God. Your relationship with God through the Holy Spirit is meant to last forever. I don't know what happened with you last week when we prayed for the Holy Spirit to come, or what has happened in the days since then. I hope that you had a really amazing experience of God's love being poured into your hearts. But perhaps you were a little disappointed. You'd hoped for something more, but it didn't quite happen. Or maybe you found it all just a little bit difficult. But you know what? It doesn't matter which of these categories you fall into. What matters is the long term. Where are you going to be in your relationship with God in 10 years time? That's what matters, not the initial experience. It's a bit like a honeymoon and a marriage. You can have a great honeymoon and a terrible marriage, or you can have a terrible honeymoon and a great marriage. Friends of mine once went on a honeymoon and they went somewhere that was really sunny. Uh, and the first day, both of them forgot to put on their suntan lotion and they couldn't touch each other for the rest of the honeymoon. <laughs> and then I heard of a couple, an elderly couple, who went on a cruise for their honeymoon and the ship sank and they had to be rescued and flown home. 65 years later, they are still really happily married. And just like in a good marriage where the relationships get better and better and better as the marriage goes on, so your relationship with God is meant to get better and better and better. That's what matters, the long term. And God loves you. He wants the best for everything. You know, talking about marriage, it's an amazing gift of God. God came out with that. This is one of the treasures that God has. God came up with the idea of marriage. God came up with the idea of sex. Think about it. It was his idea. He's not surprised by it. He's not looking down from heaven and saying, goodness gracious me, what are they going to think of next? Pleasure is God's invention, not the devil's. The devil wants to distort and destroy things that are good and beautiful. And this was God's idea. And it's a beautiful gift. There's a whole book in the Bible about the delight, the contentment and satisfaction which the sexual relationship brings in marriage. Our creator, our designer says, look, this is my beautiful gift for you. And this is how you are to use that gift. And Jesus quotes from the book of Genesis chapter 2 and verse 24. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. So we see there's a public act of leaving and there's a gluing together, not just physically and biologically, but emotionally, psychologically, spiritually and socially. And that is the context of this one flesh union that takes place through marriage. This is God's beautiful plan for sex and marriage and relationships. There's no such thing, you know, as casual sex, because this word that is used here for becoming one flesh, it's like being glued together. 
That could never be casual. Sometimes in preparing a couple to be married, I take two pieces of card, one with a picture of a man and the other with a picture of a woman, and I glue them together. And then I show that if you try to pull them apart, both cards are damaged. It causes hurt. And all around in our society, we see broken hearts. There are people whose lives are hurt, messed up. But that's not what God wants, because he loves you. He doesn't want anyone to get hurt. But neither Paul nor us can condemn those people. Actually, society, the society Paul was writing to was very immoral. But there's no sense of condemnation at all. He simply says, don't do this anymore. He doesn't say, you terrible people for having done this. He just says, don't conform any longer to the pattern of this world. God forgives. We can always make a new start. Every day can be a new start. Today can be a new start for you, no matter your past. And then Paul goes on to say some other beautiful things about love. Jesus' teaching about love is quite radical. Love your enemy. And Paul expounds it further. Don't take revenge. Bless those who curse you. Love your enemies. If they're hungry, feed them. If they're thirsty, give them something to drink. To be a Christian is quite radical. It's not just, oh, I'm just going to be a little bit better today. Being a Christian is really radical. It's all about radical love. Radical love for God. Radical love for other people. And radical love even for your enemy. And the outcome is amazing. It's so beautiful. It's the treasure which God has in store when we leave behind all the rubbish. So going back to what Paul wrote in Romans 12 and verse 1, we present our bodies, that is, we offer up everything we have, our time, perhaps our most valuable possession. We can always get more money, but we can't get more time. And so we need to use it wisely. One of the things that I've noticed in those who have put their trust in Jesus is that their priorities change. I once saw this advert in the South African Farmers Weekly magazine. There's always a page titled The Hitching Post. And this advert said, Farmer seeks lady with tractor with view to companionship and possible marriage. Please send picture of tractor. <laughs> it's, it's so easy to get our priorities wrong, isn't it? But when you experience God's love and a relationship with God, your priorities change and people become the most important thing. Relationships become the most important thing. Your relationship with God especially. And I'd encourage you to put that relationship first. Make a commitment today. Every day I'm going to spend a few minutes praying and reading the Bible. Let me tell you, that will transform your relationship with God because it's about communication and all relationships are based on communication. And then you need other people. You can't do this on your own. Make going to your Bible study group a priority, that Monday night or whatever. Make going to church a priority. It's an hour and a half a week to come together with a group of amazing people to worship God, to hear a message that's relevant to your life and to pray for one another. That's how you keep your relationship with God and prioritize it. And then ambitions. We give to God our ambitions. Should a Christian be ambitious? Well, Jesus' answer is yes. He commands us to be ambitious. He says, seek first the kingdom of God and all the other stuff that people seek after will be yours as well. But what he's saying is this. Don't make the secondary things your primary ambition. It's so sad, isn't it? When people make money their primary ambition. I mean, what's the point of that? Suppose by the end of your life, you were worth $100 million and you get to heaven and you say to God, here I am. And God says, well, what have you done with your life? And you say, well, I've made $100 million. God will probably say, oh, wow, that's going to be really useful. Yeah, we can play Monopoly in heaven. <laughs> or you might say, I wanted to be the prime minister of Australia. And then you get to heaven and God asks you, what did you do with your life? And you say, well, I was the prime minister of Australia. And God will probably say, oh, well done. We haven't had one of those here before. <laughs> So what is the point? As a secondary ambition, those are probably brilliant ideas. If your primary ambition is the kingdom of God, you could say, I want to make lots of money because I know that through that money, I can eradicate disease. I can help the poor. I can make a real difference in this world. Brilliant. Or I want to be the prime minister of Australia because then I can really make a difference in people's lives, a difference to our society, a difference to God's kingdom. Great. Go for it. But don't make it your primary ambition. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Money is such a blessing, especially when you think of what you can do if you give generously. And I'd encourage you to be the most generous person you know. 
Because generous giving is so liberating. Jesus said it's much more blessed to give than to receive. And if you want to be really blessed, give lots. And then our ears, what do we listen to? Do we listen to rubbish, to gossip to, or something? Or do we listen to the stuff that really builds us up, encourages us? And our eyes, we can use our eyes to look in lust and jealousy and all that stuff. Or we can look at people and say, that's a person whom God loves. That's a person for whom Jesus died. I'm going to love that person. I want to bring blessing to that person. How can I bring God's love to them? And then our mouths. The Apostle James says that the tongue is so powerful. It's so small, but it's so powerful. With this little thing, you can curse someone. You can wreck someone's day. You can actually wreck someone's life with your tongue. But he says you can also bless people. So determined to say, I want to use my tongue for the rest of my life to bless people. And with just a few words, you can encourage someone and make a huge difference in that person's day. Encouragement is like verbal sunshine. It doesn't cost anything, but it warms people's hearts. It changes their lives. And you can bring blessing every single day of your life to someone with the way you speak. Our hands. We can use them or we can serve with them. Our sexuality, our gratitude uh, for the good and pleasure of our marriage partner. You can't pick and choose. Paul says, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. And the extraordinary paradox is this. We think that if we do that, we're going to lose our freedom. Actually, that's the way to find our freedom. Augustine said, to give to God is perfect freedom. And that's what I want to do. The more I'm serving God, the freer I feel. And so when Paul says, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, it also means that there will be a cost. Jesus didn't come to make your life easy. He came to make you great. And that means there will be challenges. And what you have to do for a start is the challenge of getting rid of the rubbish in your life. And there's, then there's the challenge of being willing to fly the flag in what seems to be a hostile environment all around. So why do we do it? Well, let me tell you a story. There was once a wealthy man called Baron Fitzgerald. He had only one son. And tragically, this son died very young and the Baron was devastated. And so he decided to invest his life in paintings by old masters. He went around the world collecting these very valuable paintings. And when he died, his will called for there to be an auction. And at this auction, there were people again from all over the world who came because there were such valuable and sought after paintings and they came to bid for them. But he laid down his will very carefully instructions about what was to happen at the auction. And he said that the first painting that he wanted to be sold was a painting called My Beloved Son. And this was a painting that was done way before he got interested in art. It wasn't particularly well done, and it was really of very little value. It did, however, have sentimental value for the man, for it was a painting of his late son. Only one person bid for it. Someone who had worked for the family and who knew that son and who loved the son, he bid for it, and he got it for next to nothing. And then the second clause in the will was read. It said this, Whoever buys the painting, my beloved son, gets everything. The auction is now over. And that's what life is all about. Whoever buys God's beloved son gets everything. If God was prepared to give his only son for you because he loves you so much, will he not give you also everything else? So Paul says, present your body as a living sacrifice so that you can prove what God's will is for your life. And God's will for your life is good, he says. That is to say, God has good things for you to do in your life. It's pleasing. It will please you. It's perfect. That is to say, you can't do better than God. There's no point in saying, I can do it without God. We're not meant to do it without God. This is meant to be a relationship, a partnership. We go through life with him. And that's what makes it so exciting. You have great things ahead of you in your life. God loves you. He poured his love into your heart by the Holy Spirit. He's given you this amazing love for other people, for the world, love even for your enemy. That's what the Holy Spirit does. He gives us this love and he has great purpose for your life that is good, pleasing and perfect. And he wants to make a difference in your life. And you can make a difference with your life. You're a child of God, full of the Holy Spirit. You can go out and make a difference in Jesus' name. So, my friends, take some time now to discuss the following points with each other. What do you think is God's purpose for your life? 
What would need to be different in your life to find that purpose? How do you think God might help you to move forward? There are many, many things that hold us back from a life lived fully for God. So won't you join us next week as we consider the question, how can I resist evil? God bless you. Thank you.